we are not alone. These are supposed to be some of the most verified images of giants. People who do meditation for 60 days will lengthen their telomeres. Soon we'll get results and we'll let you know right here on Beyond Belief. Things seem to be changing in the field of ufology. It's going to be a bumpy ride. That's priceless. Isn't that amazing? Tesla wanted free energy. And look what happened to him. Plenty of evidence to show that they're real. The real question is how and why. There were Egyptian hieroglyphs out in the outback of Australia. In Australia. What are the possibilities? Mars was inhabited. And these were built. We almost can't duplicate today. These are amazing topics. What if there was something like an Area 51 deep underwater? They were killed by some animal. Believe me, we're just getting started. I'm George Nori, and we here at Gaia are committed to revealing the truth. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial. Without any more delay, let's go talk with Mr. Bielik in uh, Phoenix. And uh, good morning, uh, Alfred Bielik. Yes. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much. I, uh, I almost don't know where to start. I guess the best thing to do is first find out about you. Uh, whatever we can. What is your background, uh, Alfred? Well, my background is I'll be like, <clears throat> is that I was an electronic engineer. And it's from for 30 years, from 1958 to 88, but that had no bearing whatever on the Philadelphia experiment and my history with that. The history for the Philadelphia experiment involving not only the USS Eldridge, but some earlier ships and experimentation goes back a long ways. Actually, it goes back to 1931 when the first experimental considerations of the possibility of making an object invisible were engaged by Dr. Nikola Tesla, Dr. John Hutchinson of the University of Chicago, and a staff physicist by the name of Dr. Emil Curtinow, all of whom were at that time at the University of Chicago. Tesla was a man who got around quite a bit, and unlike the uh, stories which have been told about him being a recluse in his little room in the Hotel New York for the last 12 years of his life, that was anything but true. He was very busy, perhaps busier the last 12 years of his life than in the previous period. But these three people <clears throat> were involved in the consideration of how do you make an object invisible. And this was what we would today call a feasibility study, and this took place at the University of Chicago for about three years. And at that time, it was moved to the then rather brand new Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was a think tank, if you will, and it was perhaps the premier think tank of the world, because the initial staffing, which started in 1933, involved people like Dr. John von Neumann, Albert Einstein, <coughs> and Dr. Alexander, and a Dr. Oswald Fablin. They were the four original staff members, and many other people came on board at uh, various times after that. Tesla worked with him at the Institute, but he was never a staff member. He was one of the people who came and went, if you will. He was still maintaining a lot of other experimental work, a lot of other jobs he was doing. He was, in fact, a member of the team of RCA Corporation from the day of its inception in 1919 until he retired in 1939. In the last four years of his life, he was vice president and director of engineering worldwide for RCA Corporation. It's not a fact that it's well known. In fact, it is rather uh, well, shall we say, swept under the rug. Because various interests don't want the public to know the position that Tesla actually held. Al, um, a lot of the fictional accounts of invisibility uh, from The Invisible Man, which is a fairly recent movie, to The Philadelphia Experiment and a number of others, all seem to... Um, a deal with um, a very um, high energy electromagnetic fields. That's, that is correct. The original work uh, involved electromagnetics, but it's actually electromagnetics going beyond the range of electromagnetics. 
Now, the work when they transferred it to the Institute in 34 went onward. In 36, they had an experimental test, which is partly successful, but anything but fully successful. Gave them an idea of the fact that they were in the least going in the right direction. And by 1940, now the Navy in the meantime had funded this project almost from the beginning with some uh, research funds from the Office of Naval Engineering. Uh, they, they were interested from a defense point of view, obviously. That's correct. Yeah. That is their the object. And uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was very interested in this project from the beginning because Tesla was an old friend of his. And that friendship goes back to World War I in 1917 when Roosevelt, then Under Secretary of the Navy, invited Tesla to do some work, uh, war work for the government, which Tesla readily agreed to do. Tesla was, among other things, a patriot. He didn't believe in this country very strongly, and he did a great deal of work for the government. And then when the war was over, he became part of the new organization of RCA. There's a great deal of history for Tesla, which I could go into, but it's not germane, really, to the subject. In any case, they went onward with the research work, and by 1940, they had a fully successful test at the Brooklyn Navy Yard involving a small Navy ship, the Tender. And there were two ships adjacent, one starboard, one port, which carried most of the heavy equipment and the balance of the equipment. The special coils and the antenna were installed on the ship, which was to be made invisible. And the important point of that test was while it was completely successful, there were no personnel on board. It was completely deserted insofar as any uh, people, uh, any personnel of any kind. So they made a smaller ship disappear in when, 1940? 1940. Uh, late in the year, <clears throat> was at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And with that test, they knew that they had a successful system. Everyone was elated, including the Navy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and of course, they immediately classified the project. Up to that point, there was an open research project conducted by the Institute of Advanced Study. It was not classified, and it was purely <coughs> research uh, conducted by the Institute with some Navy backing, Navy funds. Now, Tesla was named the original director by Roosevelt in 1934, and Tesla remained director for this project until 19, well, March of 1942. Now, there's a lot more history in here, and I'm going to have to fill in and uh, let you know how I got involved in this thing. All right. It was not born Al Bielek. It was born Edward Cameron, and that was in August 4th, 1916. Somewhat at variance with my birth certificate is Al Bielek, which says I was born in March of 1927. Hmm. I was actually born in 1916. My father was Alexander Duncan Cameron Sr., who was a Navy man. And he went into the Navy, since we can't find any records to show when he went in and when he went left, estimated in 1910, because he was born in 1891. Why, why is there this disparity in your birth certificate and your real age and real name? Well, you have to get into the rest of the story to understand why. Uh, there was no <laughs> secret about my history at that time, up through that entire period. Oh, no, my brother, who was Duncan Cameron, who was born about seven months after I was, same father, different mother. Father was a, <clears throat> shall we say, a ladies' man, and uh, he had uh, quite a few under his wing. Two uh, common law marriages at that time, the first two wives were not legal, but from that point on they were legal. In any case, 1917, the war became the hot issue. He was called by the Navy to go to sea, and he abandoned the two women, and uh, we were both raised by Andy Cameron in Long Island. Andy Arnold, actually, is her name, married. And... Uh, we never saw a father except maybe once a year. Mm -hmm. We both uh, had uh, the advantage of a family with money and a social position, and we were admonished by father to go get a good education, which in the Depression years, of course, was the, probably the appropriate thing to do because there wasn't much else to do. Sure. So we did. We both had quite an education in physics, a Ph.D. I first went to Princeton, then I was transferred to Harvard, a Dr. Von Neumann suggestion because I met him at Princeton. Took a Ph.D. from Harvard in the summer of 39, and my brother Duncan from the University of Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Scotland, and also the summer of 1939. By father's insistence on arrangement, we both joined the Navy in September of 1939. You, so you, you have a Ph.D. in physics? Under the name of Edward Cameron. I see. Not as Al Bielek. <clears throat> I have to stress that because of what happened later. So we both joined the Navy. We were given, uh, shall we say, 
the 90-day wonder school treatment by the Navy for officers who were for special assignment. We were given commissions upon enlistment mm -hmm. of Lieutenant J.G., which was quite standard at that time. And then in January 1940, we were assigned to the Institute, the Institute of Advanced Study, where we were brought up to speed on the project. We didn't know really what we were going to be assigned to, but we knew we were going to be on some special project. And that's how we became, both Duncan, my brother, and myself, became involved in the Philadelphia Experiment. It was not called the Philadelphia Experiment in the early stage. It was still known as Project Invisibility. <laughs> well, it's correct name under the <clears throat> code name given by the Navy when they classified it was Project Rainbow. So we were brought on board at the Institute here in 1940 in January, and then they had the test in September, and then it was when they classified it and it became Project Rainbow. It was still Project Invisibility when we joined. Now after that, they set up offices in the Philadelphia Navy Yard. Of course, they had a lot of space there. And the classified aspects of this project there were continued at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. And of course, the project was also still continued at the Institute in uh, Princeton, on the Princeton grounds. And the Institute was not part of the university. It was on university property. It was a totally separate entity. Mm -hmm and the separate control, separate financing, and the whole nine yards, it was a separate entity. So the project was ongoing, <clears throat> and with a successful test, Roosevelt told Tesma he was giving him a somewhat larger ship to make it visible, literally a battleship. And he said, to Tesla, if you can make that invisible, you can make anything invisible. So we proceeded to prepare for this, we had to order equipment, do a lot of further work, and I might add that this, at that time, Tesla was, up until 1939, still involved with RCA, and he only showed up in the project maybe once a week. I did meet him a couple of times. And uh, he was ongoing still with his other lab research and lab work. I mean, he had not been a recluse by any means. I'll give you a quick thumbnail of what he had done in the period from 1931 onward when he was the alleged recluse twiddling his thumbs in the hotel room. In 1931, he had successfully produced a source of, uh, shall we say, free power, which was successful enough that he converted a Pierce Arrow automobile to an electric drive with a 75-horse motor under the hood and a little black box he carried around with him, plugged into the dashboard when he wanted to go somewhere to demonstrate this car and its feasibility. Mm -hmm. drove all over New York City, much to the elation of the press, and there was a lot of press coverage at the time. Eventually drove upstate New York and all over New York State, and eventually the car was abandoned somewhere, as I do not know the history of what happened to the car. He was also working on uh, such things as particle beam weapon systems. He had a successful one by 1935. Now, I've heard uh, a lot of this uh, about Tesla, and I've always wondered if Tesla had all of this incredible technology developed then, Yes. What happened to it? In other words, what ha happened to the documentation? He was a scientist. I presume he documented his work. Early. Why is it all lost, Al? It's not lost. It was, shall we say, swept under the rug here in the U.S. after he died. It was not lost at that time. He still had his laboratory going. He was in communication with other governments and scientists all over the world. The particle beam weapon system is quite curious in itself. He offered it to the United States. He went through a... Uh, process known as a military board of review and uh, they were at first in favor of it but the final vote uh, cast it out they were not in terms of the final vote on it interested well that's star wars today what i was saying about tesla and the particle beam weapon system he offered it to canada at that time in 35 approximately and they turned it down it was offered to england not once but many times from 35 to 39 they turned it down and they offered it to Russia in 1935, and they bought it. Uh, this is not well known, but they bought a working model and a U.S. consultancy for $25,000 cash. And a friend of mine here in Phoenix who had access to the Russian embassy in recent years found, he checked that story himself, and, they, and the Russians admitted that, yes, they did purchase the working model from Tesla in 1935, but it was lost during the war years with all the bombing, the shelling, and everything else that went on during the war years. Now, how was enough energy uh, available at that time prior to nuclear power for a particle beam weapon? Well, it doesn't use that much power. It used high voltage. 
200 million volts for a full-scale system, uh, lesser voltage for a smaller system. It did not require high power. It required high voltage and a relatively minor amount of power because the output tube, which I've seen and do have photos, or I should say sketches from or working sketches from his notes, showed a continuously evacuated tube, uh, which was evacuated on a continuously pumped basis because it had to have an open end for the discharge of the particle beam. And uh, the full-scale system would have required 200 million volts. The model's much lower. But the voltage was a very low current. All right, you say continually evacuated. Uh, I understand particle beam weapons are much more effective in space where... Oh, this was intended for ground use on the surface. Right. In space, they don't have that problem. That's very true. In any case, that was only one of the things he worked on. He also worked on a death ray system demonstrated in 1938-39 at White Sands Proving Grounds. And our friend had those notes for a number of years till they were taken, shall we say, by the government. He found out he had them in private uh, holding, and they were removed. Now, he left RCA and had more time to spend on this project and his own laboratory work, because he was still very active. And uh, in 1940, a successful test, and then he went on to prepare the battleship for a test at a later date. Now, in 1941, uh, the Navy tapped Duncan and myself on the shoulder and said, it's time to find out what the Navy's about, and sent us to sea for a year. It wasn't exactly a year. It was on the USS Pennsylvania. And from January of 41 until approximately October, we were all over the Pacific, and then the Pennsylvania came in a dry dock for overhaul in Pearl Harbor. And that's a matter of public record anyone can check. And we were on liberty and leave. We went to San Francisco on July, I'm sorry, December 5th. We were uh, to return to Pearl Harbor. We're about to uh, board a plane at the Naval Air Station in Alameda. And we were stopped. The naval captain said the orders are canceled. We were taken to a room and we were interviewed by then director of the Office of Naval Engineering, Hal Bowen Sr., mm -hmm. told us that we expect the Japanese will attack Pearl Harbor within 48 to 72 hours. We consider you people to be too valuable to send back there, so stay in San Francisco, which we did. And we returned to the Institute in 1942, and of course, Pearl Harbor on December 7th is history. Now, we returned to the project, and preparations were well underway and nearly complete for the battleship test. And Tesla was having considerable misgivings about it at that time. He knew because of the extremely high power required, electromagnetic power, that there could be damage to dead sailors because the equipment was going to be on the deck and the rotating fields were very powerful and any personnel on deck would be exposed to them and he expected there would be serious problems. And there's a good cliffhanger point. I've got an additional quick break and a couple of them coming up here, so stand by just one sec, Al. Um, the Philadelphia experiments, what we're talking about, Al Bielik is my guest. Yes. You say that Tesla was having misgivings. I want to stop and ask you for a second about um, uh, about electromagnetic fields. I, I have a bad back, Alan. I had an MRI once, and I had a demonstration by the technician of the strength of the, uh, uh, the magnetic field, and it was quite incredible, very strong. And yet, other than being able to see inside my body, there was no measurable uh, effect. Now, in, in, suddenly, in our modern society, we're all of a sudden beginning to say, well, maybe there is an effect on the biological human being from electromagnetic fields you know, the, all the controversy about the power lines and all the rest of it. So apparently there may be something, but I always thought magnetics, uh, as a general rule, didn't have any effect at all on, a, on, a, on flesh and blood. Well, if it's a DC field, you will find little or no effect. Uh -huh. uh, the problem is if it's an AC field at certain critical window frequencies, these have been charted, of course, since that day and that period. <clears throat> the information is well known now. There are critical window frequencies which affect the brain directly because the brain is affected and is receptive to magnetic frequencies of modulation in the magnetic domain. But, but only uh, alternating current. Uh, that is correct. Mm -hmm. An alternating field or even a pulse field over the course of the uh, Fourier series of uh, frequencies, harmonics, which uh, attain to a pulsed train, you have the same problem. Of course, a pulsed output or a square wave output, you have many more frequencies than the fundamental. Absolutely. Now, that was only part of the problem. The other aspect is that high-frequency electric fields, that is RF fields, will also affect the body and the brain if it's at the right frequencies. 
The Japanese did a lot of work on this during World War II. Oh, no, absolutely. In fact, uh, at high enough frequencies, you literally cook as you would in a microwave oven. Very true. And even without cooking, you have frequencies which will affect the mind and the brain. Mm -hmm. And the effect on the neurological system is not at the level of uh, RF heating, which was the old standard in the United States. The Russians have long since have learned better, and of course they do know better here now, but the standard used to be one-tenth of a watt or 100 milliwatts per square inch was considered the threshold of heating of human tissue, and that was considered the danger point, and no consideration was given to the biological effects of much weaker fields. Uh, over long term as well. A long term or short term, the window frequency short term. Now that, of course, is modern data, and it's all a result of the Philadelphia experiment and with the aftermath and all of the studies that were made. I don't want to get too technical on everybody, Al, uh, but I would be interested, what kind of frequency range are you talking about when you say window frequencies? Window frequencies in terms of the human brain, the magnetic response, you're dealing in frequencies typically below 30 hertz. Oh, very low frequencies, then. That's correct, ELF. Oh, I'll be darned. And I thought you were going to say just the opposite. I thought you were going to talk about one gigahertz and up. No, RF, you will talk oh. about high frequencies in the range of, uh, of the spinal resonance around 450 megahertz. The uh, brain cavity resonance is somewhere, depending on the size of the cavity of the human head, anywhere from roughly 850 to 1,000 megahertz, mm -hmm. or one gigahertz which also gets into the range of the cellular phone and the problem. I was just about to say that, these people holding these cellular phones up. Uh... Tesla was concerned because he knew that with the amount of power that was involved that there would be serious problems with Navy personnel. He went to the Navy and asked for an extension of time. He says he was certain he could solve the problem, but he needed more time. And, of course, he received the usual answer at that time, was there's a war on, you've got a test date and need it. So he had the choice of going ahead and uh, hoping for the best, or as he did choose, sabotage the test, detune the equipment so nothing happened and nobody was hurt. And of course, he at that point... Was that was the first test, Al, on the, on the big ship? That was the first test of a big ship. And he detuned the equipment, actually took it off frequency so it wouldn't happen? That's correct. He deliberately sabotaged the test. I'll be darned. No one was hurt. And of course, that altered his uh, historic record of having an impeccable history of never failing on any project. So he did on that one, and he bowed out and says, uh, the test is a failure, gentlemen. I have other things to do. I'm leaving this project. Well, the question is whether he left voluntarily or had a little assistance from the Navy. It doesn't matter. He left the project. And it was not very long after that, since it was March 42 in uh, January of 1943, he died. And that was on the 7th of January. But he was separated from the project at that point and turned it over to Dr. John von Neumann, who then became the director. And von Neumann looked at the projects, told the Navy, I'll have to look and see what went wrong. It didn't take him long to find out what was wrong, but he decided to avail himself of the time and redesign the equipment. Mm -hmm. And he went, unlike uh, Tesla, who was an analog man, liked to use continuous waves with special modulation waveforms, Von Neumann was a man who liked to do pulsed work. In other words, pulse the system uh, with energy. As you would radar. As you would radar, exactly. Uh -huh. Sure. And uh, he decided to redesign the equipment for that. The basic mathematics, the basic, basic approach was still the same. And the basic approach involved rotating fields, a rotating magnetic field outside of a rotating electric field, mm. uh, both counterclockwise. And the equipment design involved some changes, and particularly upping the power. Uh, von Neumann went up to a 2 megawatt power output with a booster on each RF transmitter. Well, I, I can't say a standard AM transmitter, but a standard transmitter of the day, in which they were pushing the state of the art because the output was 160 megahertz, which was high frequency in those days, but definitely within the realm of uh, capability because radar was functional in those days and they were running a still higher frequency. You say 160 megahertz? Right, at uh, 2 megawatts. Oh my gosh, uh, that's a VHF frequency typically used by uh, two-way two communications. Police are a little lower, uh, but it's in that area. But those days it was in the radar range because you didn't go to 400 megahertz range until, for radar until the war was over. Right. And uh, <clears throat> that was as far as the RF transmitters were concerned, four of them, feeding a special quadriphase antenna. And I'm speaking of the final design for the Eldridge. 
uh, which <clears throat> was the antenna was designed by T. Townsend Brown. He had been pulled into the Navy in 1938 to work on uh, another problem, namely the German magnetic mines. But he was also an RF man, and he made contributions to the project. Now, in the redesign by von Neumann, <clears throat> he decided that he wanted a ship which was designed from the ground up for these tests. Mm -hmm. So this was uh, roughly in the spring months of 1942, and long, about roughly July, he went to the uh, Newark shipbuilding yards, which were not far from Philadelphia, picked a number off the drawing board, DE-173, and gave instructions how he wanted the ship modified. Namely, we're not con uh, completely complete and finish the interior of the ship. We'll leave it gutted, put two rails along the bottom, and leave gun turret number two unfinished so they could drop the heavy equipment in. In the case of the battleship and trying to outfit it without uh, designing it from the ground up, the heavy equipment was on the deck. So he wanted the two large generators for the four Tesla coils mm -hmm. buried in the guts of the ship. They were 75 kVA each driven by a 750-horsepower motor with two right-angle gearbox drives, and that's some pretty heavy equipment. Yes, it is. And that went in the hold of the ship, along with the diesel-electric generator to supply power for the system, which was totally separate from ship's power. And that was a 8-megawatt monster. So they had some heavy equipment in the hold. And the ship came down the waves in September of 42, went into dry dock, they put the heavy equipment in board the ship, and then in September... I'm sorry, December of 42, a ship under its own power went to the uh, Philadelphia Navy Yard in the interior section, which was a classified work, and the rest of the electronic equipment was installed. Uh, I, w I wish to stop you for a second so that I can understand the, um, the layout of the fields again. You've got an RF field, uh, I take it first. Yes, and there's special mast midships on top of the highest mast of the ship. And this produced a rotating electric field because of the design of the rest of the electronic equipment. Right. And the field was provided by four transmitters, each were pulsed at special pulse rates, which is part of the whole system, and a lot of electronics which preceded it. Now, in addition to that, you had four large conical Tesla coils. When I say a Tesla coil, not the full-blown type, which one is familiar with today with a primary and a secondary. Right. But a single coil, which was round in a conical shape, narrow at the top, wide at the base. There was one inch, essentially one inch copper tubing, hollow and cooled. And there was a single turn, like a spiral, expanding, and was fed at the top and the bottom and cables from the generator. They had two large generators, two outputs from each generator, and these were phased <clears throat> due to the rest of the electronic equipment so that you had a rotating magnetic field because of the phasing of the, in, of the uh, generators and the associated electronics. So these four coils were placed on the deck of the Eldridge, two forward, two aft, right. and of course there were two in starboard and two port, and they were symmetrically arranged around the antenna. Okay. And they were driven with very high power current pulses. And there was a certain rate, approximately a 10% duty cycle, and frequency so that you wound up with a rotating magnetic field. Now this rotating field was outside of the electric field in essence. And without getting too technical on this... Was the R... I'm still trying to understand. I'm sorry, Al, don't mean to interrupt. Uh, was the RF field rotating or was it a constant output? Oh, they were both rotating. They were both rotating. At different frequencies. At different frequencies and not, not, in, not in synchronization other... We were in synchronization, essentially, yes, because well, one was twice the rate of the other. All right. They were both tied, mathematically speaking, in terms of the rotating rate to what is a fundamental number for everything on this planet, namely pi over 2. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, I think I finally understand. Okay. Now, this, of course, was in the final embodiment of the equipment. Uh, the ship had to be outfitted with the electronic equipment and everything that went with it. Duncan and I were back on the project, of course, from uh, January 42 onward, and uh, <clears throat> we saw the failure of the battleship test. We saw the whole procedure for the development of the Eldridge, which at that time was not called the Eldridge. It was just a number, DE-173. It did not become the Eldridge until it was christened, which was in August of 43. Mm -hmm. Now, with the uh, outfitting of the ship, 
and there, were, there was a lot of testing and uh, some other problems. Of course, they never tested the full system until it was out in the harbor. They also went through the Navy and decided, the Norman decided, and the Navy concurred to have a special volunteer test crew for these tests, all volunteer. How many were aboard totally? In the final test, there was 15 sailors and about six officers for the test, and each of the two tests for the average. Fifteen sailors and how many officers? Six. Six officers, okay. And I was two of two of them were included, Duncan and myself. Right. As we were trained to run the equipment in the hold, actually, which was a control room on the surface of the ship, behind steel doors and steel bulkheads. So you weren't able to see out on the deck? No, not with the bulkhead door closed, which was a normal procedure while operating the equipment. Right. In any case, a lot of prece preliminary tests preceding the final test, and von Neumann started to get the shakes about the personnel problem himself about, oh, roughly March of 1943, mm -hmm. and he decided to add a third generator to try and produce a counter field, and that never worked. It could never be synchronized with the other two. The other two required very special electronic... What, what was the purpose of the counter field? To provide some kind of protection in von Neumann's mind to the effects of the other main field to the personnel. The system never worked. It only succeeded in zapping a technician who was working with us in the control room. He was going to try and nullify the field in a certain area. Correct. It didn't work, and he consequently abandoned the, uh, the approach for the third generator, went back to the two generator approach, and uh, was essentially ready for tests in July of 1943. Now, all of this equipment was aboard the average. There were preliminary sectional tests, and we were thoroughly instructed in what was to be done and how the procedure was, because you have to understand in those days there were no computers. Right. The computer was invented by von Neumann, but at a later date, after the war was over. And everything was manually run, so that the concern at that time was to produce a field of invisibility, which would be both optical and, of course, by 43. We had very good radar. It was developed in the years prior to the war, but it was almost uh, unknown until 1941-42. So invisible optically and to radar. And to radar. That's only an extension of uh, one of the other, because the optical high frequencies are much higher electromagnetic frequency range than radar. Mm -hmm. Radar in those days was running around 160 to 200 megahertz. So the final test was the first test, not final, was decided to be held on the 20th of July, they spread it to the 22nd, and then they held it in the harbor of Philadelphia. There was an observer ship uh, with a man running the test. The man in charge of it was a Captain Harrison, now dead. And of course, on that ship was Van Neumann, another scientist, another Navy personnel. It was a carrier as the observer. So he was at least confident enough to be on board during it himself. He was on board the observer ship. Not oh, 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 I said, then he wasn't. <laughs> he was not on the Eldridge. I see. No, the only people on the Eldridge are those who were involved directly in the test, which included Duncan and myself. Did they advise you of the danger of what you were about to do? No. No? No, they did not. There was no allusion to there being any real danger, but there was an allusion to the fact that there could be problems. And Van Neumann did not expect any kind of a serious problem. Uh, in case of, for those who have saw, seen the movie, where they saw these banks and banks of electron tubes, that was quite accurate except for one thing. In the movie version, they showed miniature tubes. In the real version, they were using 6L6s in the large glass bulb size. 6L6s? Yes. And I know about a 6L6. That was the first tube I used in my first ham transmitter. <laughs> it was commonly used for many years, that's true. With a 6AG7 driver. Right. <laughs> 6L6s were used to drive the fuel coils of the generators, 3,000 of them. Wow. Uh, there was actually 300 per fuel coil. There were five fuel coils on each generator. Don't ask me why that configuration was chosen. I couldn't answer that one. I, I'm very impressed, Al, with your ability to describe the technical aspect of this. I'm very pleased about that. I know a lot of people in the audience won't understand it, but I'm understanding what you're saying, and uh, you're, you're very impressive. So on the 22nd of July, they were ready for a test, and we were out in the harbor, and we received command by radio to the radio operator to proceed with the test, so we fired up the equipment in the appropriate uh, order. 
and they ran the test for about 20 minutes. And the ship was invisible to the eye other than for a slight haze in the area where the ship was. It was actually in the water, and it was totally invisible to radar. It just faded right off the radar screen. Did that invisibility occur instantly, or what, did it sort of phase in slowly, or how did it? Phased in slowly. It did oh. not occur instantly. All right. How w would you be able to confine the field um, to precisely to the, uh, the the mass of the ship, Al, or did you actually take some, some seawater with you? It took some seawater with you. Ah. That became the concern of Captain Harrison because he saw a large water line, much larger than the ship, and uh, from his viewpoint on the deck of the carrier, looking with a pair of binoculars, all he could see was a big hole under the ship, and it appeared like the ship was floating in air. That is, there was a big gap there. He couldn't see the ship, but he could see that the into the outline of the ship where it should be, and the water line <clears throat> was much larger than the ship, and he couldn't see the bottom, so to speak, where the water was. It was a fairly deep section of the harbor. Wow. And he became very concerned that maybe the ship was floating in air. It wasn't. But the, to all appearances, sure. there was air there, and he was afraid because of the way the ship was put together with the gutted interior that the thing would break in half without water support. So he ordered the test terminated after 20 minutes. Well, let's let's go to you for a moment. What were you? What was your job? What were you doing? Uh, and Duncan were running the equipment. In other words, we had the dual responsibility, not only of turning the equipment on in proper sequence, checking the mirrors, knowing what the basic physics involved was, but also in case something went wrong, we had to diagnose what might have gone wrong and, if necessary, shut the equipment off. And Once the invisibility occurred, uh, or, or, or that effect began. As you looked at your own hand, what did you see? A hand. You see, the effect was not on board the ship. As you, as you look, oh, I see. So, ship. A, and as you looked at, at anything in the ship, it too appeared as normal. Internally to the ship and to anyone on the deck, the, the ship appeared essentially normal, except for one factor. There was a heavy haze around the ship, and that heavy haze was ozone gas, which was generated by these fields. Um, so for 20 minutes, this ship disappeared. That's right. uh, I, I'm going to ask a dumb question, ask where did it go, and you're going to say nowhere. It didn't go anywhere, as it was still there in the harbor. There was, in fact, even a test with somebody coming by with a launch to see if they could touch the hull of the ship. Well, they were a little bit far away, but what they found was that there was a viscous-like resistant field. They couldn't even get their hand up to their elbow into it. It was resisting any attempt to penetrate it. So we're generating a field of a very unusual nature, and that field was outside of the ship by a fair distance, depending on the power. And actually what you had was a, a toroidal field, and the toroidal field was rotating, but it was also bisected across the donut, like you sliced the donut in half across the full diameter. Mm -hmm. One half of the field was above the waterline, the other half was below the waterline. <laughs> produced a very unusual effect because the end result of that was your rotating magnetic field was essentially unipolar above the waterline. What happened to the biological entities, the people on board the ship? When the uh, order was given to terminate the test and return to dockside, there was no problem. They did return the ship to dockside. There were certain numbers of personnel stationed on the deck to see what they saw and what they observed. These people, these sailors, were totally disoriented sick, nauseous, uh, out of it as the saying goes, and uh, mentally very confused. They were not insane and they were not uh, in the state which happened on the second test. But in any case, <clears throat> the Navy says, well, it's no problem, we have another test crew, because they only took about one half of the special group who have trainees who went through a special 90-day training school at the Coast Guard Academy, headed by my father, believe it or not. And uh, they said, well, we have another crew for you, no problem. And so Van Neumann says, well, I've got to find a means to solve this problem. And he asked the Navy for more time. Well, they didn't initially give him a date for the second test. But what happened was that after about a week, they said, okay, you've got a drop-dead date, the 12th of August, 1943. Complete your tests by then or forget it. Well, we couldn't figure out what the blazes this was all about. It never it made no sense that anyone had ever given such an order before. 
and I went to Halbo and I said, where did this order come from? He found out it came from the Chief of Naval Operations, who was Admiral King at that time, which made even less sense, because he was only concerned with the operation of the Navy's part in the worldwide theater of operations and running the war. Mm -hmm. Why should he be concerned about an engineering test? We never did find the answer to that till many, many years later. But in any case, came the 12th, <clears throat> we had a great deal of concern about it, and Norman did not have time enough to make any major change in the equipment. Um, we're almost over the news here, but why were your concerns greater about the second test than the first? Well, we were concerned more about the second test for this reason. Captain Harrison had decided that because of what he saw through the binoculars, he wanted special uh, additional tests run, like they put pressure uh, reading equipment on the hull, inside and outside. Let's talk second experiment. Well, okay. To continue where I left off, <clears throat> they decided they wanted to do some pressure testing on the hull to find out exactly what was going on, have a second crew placed on board, which was to operate that equipment only, and they assigned a submarine to go under the ship and find out well, what was going on with the water line or whatever. Makes sense, yeah. So all of this was set up for the final test on the 12th of August. And we had the crew on board and everything ready to go. And the last minute, something happened. They pulled the crew, the special crew, and put them on the sub, removed the sub, and then told us of the regular crew for the test to go ahead for the test. Well, at that point, needless to say, Duncan and I were very concerned. What's going on here? There's, we had that funny gut feeling that something was terribly wrong, but we didn't know what. So at the appropriate time, we were given the radio command to proceed, and uh, we had two changes. One, the Navy decided to relax the requirement for optical invisibility or just radar because they decided, if you understand, in those days, there was no lower end, no shore end, and uh, none of the sophisticated navigation systems we have today or satellites or whatever. Right. And if you didn't have radar visibility, you better have some kind of optical visibility at night in a storm, or you might be ramming adjacent ships in a convoy, because right. it was typically the way they ran across the Atlantic, was in a large convoy. And they were trying to thwart the German uh, sink rate, which was then approximately 50% of the shipping crossing the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. So there we were, and we had orders to proceed with the final test, finally received by radio, so we proceeded and fired up the equipment. And for the first, to, to those observing on the outside, and at this point there were three observer ships. There was a carrier, there was a Coast Guard cutter, and there was a commercial ship known as the SS Freyaseth, a merchant marine ship. Mm -hmm. The merchant marine, of course, was very interested in the system that worked. They wanted to immediately outfit some of their ships in mm -hmm. crossing the Atlantic. So we had three observer ships. We turned the equipment on, and for about the first 70 or so seconds, everything appeared to be functioning according to plan, i.e. radar and visibility, but you could still see the ship through a haze. The ship was still visible, but not in the normal sense of visibility. It was uh, shrouded, if you will. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, there was a blue flash, and the ship disappeared, waterline and all, and there was no ship in the harbor. It was gone, and I don't mean visibly gone, it was physically gone, and it was gone for about four hours, and then at four hours approximately, the ship suddenly reappeared in the harbor, and needless to say, von Neumann and everybody was panicked when this happened, and there was no way to raise anyone on the radio, there was absolutely no radio connection, the ship reappeared, <clears throat> and uh, they immediately observed from the observing carrier, the, the principal observer ship, that there was something wrong. Part of the antenna mass special one was gone. There was some superficial damage on the deck of the ship. I, I, I can't stand it, Al. Where did the ship go? I'll get to that. Okay. And uh, the, there was some visible uh, crew running around like crazy, and nobody responded on the radio. So they had a special launch go out with a boarding crew. And when they boarded the ship, they found out much more about what happened. They found two men buried in the steel deck. Two men were buried upright in the steel bulkhead. The fifth man had his hand buried in the steel bulkhead. He lived, he's the only one of the five that lived. He cut his hand off and gave him an artificial hand later. And uh, absolute pandemonium when they found this. And those who were still on deck were insane and uh, totally out of it. I mean, do mean insane. And those below deck were perfectly all right because they were shielded by the steel. Right.
I mean, one man developed the problem of uh, intermittent and uncontrolled invisibility, but probably due to flux leakage due to the saturating of the steel. In any case, a uh, special crew was put on board. The ship was brought back to dockside of the Philadelphia Navy Yard. And they had four days of inquiry and hearing what happened. So I made my report. I was there. Duncan was not. He was you know, among those who were missing. And uh, nobody believed my report. Van Norman didn't believe it. But in any case, he told me, I'll talk with you later. They opted for one more test. <clears throat> like the first test in 1940, that was successful. After replacing the uh, damaged equipment, uh, it will be in the outer harbor of Philadelphia late at night, sometime late October, 1,200 hours, 2,200 hours at night, and uh, run it on long cables, like a 1,000 feet of cable to the adjacent ship to control it. After the uh, ship was on station, remove the personnel, mm -hmm. control the equipment by remote cable, which they did, and the ship disappeared, came back about 15, 20 minutes later, Equipment in the hold was a smoking room, and some of it was missing. So at that point, the Navy washed the hands of the whole project. So we were scrapping it, put the normal uh, equipment on board the Eldridge, uh, reacted it for war service. That was done. <clears throat> this was war service during 44 and 45. Sometime in 46, we put in mothballs and remained there until 1951, I think it was, 51 or 2, when it was turned over to the Greek Navy as part of the uh, group that was ships turned over to the Greek Navy by President Truman. I was renamed the Leon, and believe it or not, that ship is still in service in the Greek Navy today. We've had feedback on it in the last two months. That's an astounding story. Uh, so now, if I can... Uh, what happened? That's right. What happened? You were on board. Where'd that ship go? What happened to us? That is Duncan and I. Yes. In the first 30 seconds, uh, everything appeared to be normal after the equipment was operational. Then we noticed strange waverings in the tubes, and then some strange electrical arcing started to take place in the control room. Now, this was totally unprecedented because there was no high voltage right there and that we could induce such arc over. But nevertheless, it happened. It was continuing. We tried to raise somebody on the radio because in the, another change in the interim was they put a direct link to the radio transmitter and a receiver in our control room rather than going through a remote uh, signaling system and a remote link mm -hmm. radio tower, so to speak. And uh, we raised no one, couldn't hear anyone, so we were on our own. And we decided at that point, well, this equipment's going haywire. This is not according to plan. We'd better shut it down. Went to the main control handles for the main AC power to the equipment, and we yanked on and grabbed on them. We tried to force them, they wouldn't budge. We could not break power connection. Conditions continued to get worse in the control room, so we decided, let's get out of here. We opened the bulkhead door, ran out on deck. So a sail was milling around very severely. No one was buried in the deck at that time. And uh, we got the bright idea, well, let's jump overboard and swim ashore. We were both good swimmers. So we did jump overboard. Now, I must state, at that point, we could see nothing beyond the railing of the ship. It was just a gray fog, if you will, a, a gray something. We right. didn't know what it was, but we couldn't see anything beyond the ship. The ship was still quite visible of itself, though there was a haze running around on the ship. We jumped overboard. We never hit the water. We started, we didn't know what was happening, but we started to fall and fall and fall through what appeared to be, or felt like a tunnel of some kind. Mm -hmm. and all kinds of strange flashing lights. And eventually, we wound up standing on our feet on dry land. Uh, quite a change from the expected water landing. I should say. Uh, on dry land at night on the inside perimeter of a military base. There's a chain link fence immediately to our back. And suddenly, there was a bright searchlight beaming down on us from what was obviously a helicopter overhead. Mm -hmm. and we didn't know what a helicopter was because in 43, there were still play toys things which Sikorsky was working on, selling a few to the military, but they certainly were not a mainstay at that period. Today, they are a mainstay of the military. So here we were spotlighted by a searchlight, and MPs came out of nowhere. This is where the story deviates from the movie. They grabbed us immediately, took us to a building. In the building we went, got on an elevator, it took us down several levels. Elevator doors opened. <clears throat> we saw a lot of military personnel running around, and an elderly civilian came forward and greeted us <clears throat> and said to us, I've been expecting you, gentlemen. I am Dr. John Van Neumann. Oh, 
He looked at him and said, you're who? And I said, I'm Dr. Von Neumann. I said, you can't be. We left him about an hour ago. He's a much younger man. He said, no, I'm sorry, gentlemen. You're no longer in 1943. I'm 40 years older. This is 1983, and you're at Montauk, Long Island, part of the Phoenix Project. Well, we thought he was nuts. Wow. However, he gave us the grand tour of the underground base. We saw computers which did not exist in 43, graphic displays, large screen color TV, and other electronic apparatus totally beyond anything we knew of in 1943. So we were not only impressed, we were thoroughly distraught. Finally, we sat down and watched TV for a few hours. So we found out later, we arrived at about 2 a.m. in the morning on the 12th of August, 1983, on Montauk, Long Island. The base was at the extreme eastern end of Long Island on what is known as the Montauk Air Force Station, long since abandoned, but 1983 was still operational in terms of this project. So we watched Color TV, which of course didn't exist in 43. And when you see ads for 747 jet aircraft and men on the moon and discussions about the moon landings and the Cold War with Russia and a few other things, we knew something was terribly wrong. Holy mackerel, Al. And a few shots of modern freeways and traffic jams and, and that sort of thing. That, that could be psychologically... It was devastating. Devastating is a good word. Now, uh, here you are. In the, uh, you jumped off the ship. You're on dry land, greeted by a helicopter with a spotlight, and you're on a military base, and you're in 1983. Correct. Oh. We didn't believe it at first, but uh, after watching uh, everything, seeing the evidence, we actually went up uh, during the daylight hours up uh, above the ground on the base. They did not let us off the base. But we did have a look around. It was a very large military base, and it's still there, though it would be funked at the present time. Uh-huh. And uh, defunct in terms of the surface buildings. That's another long story on the Montauk project. But in any case, finally, Van Neumann told us, as a well, gentlemen, uh, perhaps you're convinced now. I said, well, now we'll have to tell you the rest of the story. He says, I've known the whole story for some time. I've had it in my records. said, you... We'll go back. We have to send you back to the Eldridge so that you can smash the equipment and shut it off. He says, we can't control it from here. It's still running. The ship disappeared into hyperspace and into a hyperspace bubble, which is a mathematical artificial reality. And it's sustained by the fields generated by the equipment on board the ship. And so there's enough fuel there to keep it running for 30 days if something doesn't break down. They said, the problem is that there, this hyperspace bubble is growing, and we don't know what it's going to and compass and how large it may get, it could engulf the entire Earth. Now, if you remember from the movie, there was an allusion to this, and that is the movie, The Philadelphia Experiment, released in 84, of uh, this growing huge storm and the uh, energy is oh. growing. Oh, yes, 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 Al. I'm, I've got it on tape. I'm going to go right home this morning and watch it. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you got to go back and destroy the equipment on the average so I can return to the harbor in 43. And I said, well, that's great. Just how are we supposed to do that? He says, we'll send you back. And I said, and just how are you going to do that? He says, well, we have complete control over space and time here on this project. We can send you anywhere we want. So we scratched our heads again. We didn't believe them, but they did send us back to the, de the decks of the Eldridge. And the Montauk project is another long story of itself. They did indeed have control of space and time. And that is another long total story. But well, then we obviously have uh, time travel. We've had it since 1945. Good heavens. Actually, and, and not just time, time travel, but, but apparently simultaneously through space as well. Yes. Now, that's a much later development. That was the Montauk project in the 60s and the 70s. Actually, it didn't come online without a cable but, but until 76, 77. What I'm saying is that actually occurred with the Philadelphia experiment because that ship moved not just in time but in space. Correct. That was not intended. It was an accident, so to speak. But the two experiments locked up, and he knew it. <clears throat> so he sent us back so we could smash the equipment. So we're back on the deck of the Eldridge. We go in the control room. We find axes, and we start smashing everything in sight. And eventually, we <clears throat> have enough equipment. The lines cut and equipment smashed, mostly the 6062s and some auxiliary electronic equipment. The main generator started to wind down. And at that point, we knew the thing was over. So we went back to that on deck. And then, of course, at that point, we saw the bodies buried in the steel. Uh, the, however, we still couldn't see the harbor, and one of the things that turned up was 
a younger brother by the name of Jim, who was six years younger than Duncan and myself, had enlisted in the Navy after the war started, wound up volunteering for that special test crew, and wound up in the second test, and he was dying in the bulkhead. His head and shoulders were out of the steel, and when he was crying, I went over and put my arm around him, and of course he died that way, and Duncan took one look at this mess, and looked at me and jumped overboard and disappeared. He wound up back in the Montauk Project, probably in 83. Records indicate, as we found since, that it was in 83 that he arrived. And that's another long story, but I will go back to what happened so far as the ship is concerned. All right. After Duncan jumped overboard, the fields collapsed. It took about two minutes because they had been building up for many, many hours. Right exactly how long in hyperspace you can't stay, but in terms of time at Philadelphia, it was four hours. So they collapsed. We saw the normal harbor. The ship was seen to return, and of course, they sent the launch out, and so forth. And I remained with the ship. I made my report. I told them what happened, where I went. Nobody believed me. Van Neumann later took me aside and says, I don't know whether to believe you or not. He says, we're going to find out. So he built a time machine there at the Institute, a small but workable one. And the technology for that was very little different than what we were dealing with in terms of the invisibility experiment. Uh, so we said, you're going back to 83, and you're going to get proof and bring it back to me to prove that you were there and that I was there. <laughs> oh, he did. He sent me more than once. And I came back with proof that he accepted. So no more of that experiment. And of course, he was satisfied. It went into a report somewhere. And, of course, October of 43, after that part was over, he was part of the atomic bomb project at Los Alamos. He made his first trip up there in late October. I guess we could conclude, then, that the technology from 83 has continued. Surely that's not something they've dropped. No. So, so they have that and much more capability now. Yes, and furthermore, the project, though, it was scuttled by the Navy in 43, was resurrected in 1947 when they asked Dr. Van Neumann to resurrect the project and see if he could salvage anything from it and find out what really went wrong. In 46, of course, he was involved in the race with the British on building the first all-electronic digital computer, and uh, he won the race, despite what BBC says. And uh, <clears throat> the first computer was completed in 1952. The first working model is today in the Smithsonian, and there's a documentary on that. But in any case, the first one was completed, and he built a new system for the Navy, having solved the problem. In 53, they had a new test on another ship, and there was no personal side effects. It was declared a success finally, and of course, they reclassified the project again and put it under the code name Project Phoenix. All right, an obvious question now. Yeah. If we have this capability now, invisibility, uh, why not? Why are we building stealth aircraft? Why are we putting special skins on aircraft in corners that are non-reflective of radar and that sort of thing? If we have technology that uh, will do that, or is it still uh, to the degree that uh, you could not fit it, for example, reasonably on an airplane? Or no, they've long since solved that problem. Well, fit it for aircraft. It's on the, used on the B-1 bomber, the B-2, which is a stealth bomber. You're saying this technology is being used for stealth? Yes, that's on all Navy fighter aircraft. It was Israeli fighter aircraft, uh, the SR-71. Holy. All of the large Navy... How, hold, hold on. Um, I would like to get the audience involved, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. Uh, I'll just finish that statement. Yes. That the large supercarriers have the capability. And it's even today down to a personnel size, individual backpack, uh, belt pack, if you will, where an individual can become invisible. Well, that's a disturbing thought. Yes. Yeah. So for the rest of us visible folk who manipulated much of this technology, at least in the later phases, they did not in terms of the product experiment, because that was a homegrown experiment involving the Institute of Advanced Study in the Navy. But then it got into the phases after 1947. You then start running into political considerations, uh, the UFO problem, a group called MJ-12, and the secret government. And the secret government is determined to have a one-world government, the so-called New World Order, which I'm sure everybody's heard the term, mm -hmm. uh, promulgated by Bush and company. And this is the real just of it, the secret government. They have control of all of this technology. We no longer, as a nation, 
really control all of that technology. We no longer as a nation have the kind of authority and position we once had. Do most people buy it, or how do you deal with the incredible aspects of this story? I mean, it is incredible. This beats most UFO stories I've heard. <laughs> well, I think you could say that in many respects it does. Now, the problem here is that, yes, there are a lot of people who have never heard the story before. They have not read any other material that's been in the open literature since 1955 dealing with the Philadelphia experiment. Uh, there's much additional material I can give you on this, but nevertheless, the movie was made in 1984. It was released telling basically the story, but a lot of Hollywood fill-in with a yeah. love story in the interest of sure, running sure. around Nevada, yeah. California. They, they can't make movies without love scenes. Oh, right. It's, a lot of that never occurred. The beginning and the ending is the beginning is very accurate. The ending is nearly accurate. All right. But uh, in any case, there is a problem there. If you have not been exposed to this, yeah, how can this possibly be? I agree with the gentleman. To be hit with this all at once is skepticism, but do your research. Eventually you'll find enough information that you'll probably agree that it happened, because there is information available in spite of government suppression. Uh, Al, is it possible to change what occurs in time? Yes and no. Uh, <clears throat> yes, you can if you know what you're doing, but the point is they are more concerned with altering the present by looking at the future in order to make the future come out the way the current ruling elite want it to come out. Uh, changing the past is more difficult. It can be done, but it's very difficult. You get into problems of quantum mechanics and quantum physics. I guess what I'm asking really is uh, these world leaders that are, um, uh, according to you and others, uh, in concert headed us, heading us toward a one world government, is there an inevitability about it uh, in that it's going to happen whether we like it or not, or can we change it between now and whenever it coalesces? Uh, it can be changed. There's no such thing as it being cast in stone. Uh, they would like to see, to the fact that it would become inevitable from their point of view. That's why they're trying to change time and events by looking in the future. There is a project called the Project Looking Glass, which is a view into the future. There are other more complex machines today built from the 70s onward where they can travel in time as well as look in time. <laughs> They have uh, some, shall we say, some restrictions on that in terms of the future. Preston, I don't have a, uh, any sort of biographical uh, sketch on you, so why don't you tell me, tell everybody who you are. I'm essentially an electrical engineer, graduated from University of Tampa, attended the Polytechnic Institute of New York. I've worked in the uh, military industrial establishment for a number of years worked on many uh, secret projects, including the Montauk Project. Okay, are you now, uh, are you retired now? I consider myself semi-retired. I've been forced to be semi-retired. Okay. Uh, I have my own business now. You have your own business, all right. Yeah. You want to tell us what kind of business? We do uh, electronics manufacturing, small manufacturing, uh, R&D work, uh, testing, we do rebuilding of electronic equipment for the small industries in Long Island here. Very good. Uh, all right, Preston, um, what in the world uh, is or was, is the Montauk Project still going on? Yes, it is. It is? Mm hmm uh, When did it begin, and what can you tell us about it? Well, as far as we know, it traces back to about 1947. When they, when they decided to restart the Philadelphia experiment to find out what actually went wrong and why the people on the boat were not able to take the uh, field. As we've all heard before, the Philadelphia experiment is where they attempted to make a ship, a Navy ship radar, invisible. They got total invisibility and the thing disappeared. And they got sucked into a hole in hyperspace between 1943 and 1983. Excuse me. So what actually happened is they did a lot of R&D work. The project split into two. The engineering went to Los Alamos, we believe, and that's where they developed the stealth technology that's on the third level of the stealth aircraft these days. The other part of the project, which was the human factors project went to Brookhaven National Laboratories, which was the largest human factors <coughs> research in the United States. This is now about 1950, we believe. 
to join what was known as the Phoenix Project, which was a very large, all-encompassing research project involving research into the human mind, the mind of man. I cannot go into what that's all about because I did sign security on that. <clears throat> they made you. They made you. They made you sign a paper. Mm -hmm. Well, when you get employment, anything that they have you sign, it would be illegal and jail time to talk about. You'd be uh, convicted of espionage. That's right. See, on the Montauk project, they used different methods of security, which we can get into a little later. Where I never signed for it. So there will be some some of it that you can talk about. Yeah, the Montauk project I can talk of because that I never signed for. In fact, officially I never existed on that project. Oh. Um, well, all right. Uh, let's back up a little bit. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that you've heard Al Belik's, uh description of the Philadelphia experiment. Yes, I have many times. Do you uh, do you agree with or quarrel with it, or do you think it's accurate, or do you know of any inaccuracies or anything you'd like to correct about what he said about it? Well, essentially, what he's saying is very controversial. I believe there are many different tests of radar invisibility, total invisibility, that the government research did attempt in World War II, and He's reporting on one test. If you read the popular Bill Moore book, Bill Moore compiled all sorts of information, which was on a number of different kinds of tests, different kinds of procedures used. This is why the book is somewhat confusing. I was speaking essentially from personal experience, <coughs> excuse me, in talking with a lot of other people that he's come across, just as I've come across people. The Philadelphia experiment did happen. It was definitely a high-energy physics project. There is other information coming to surface saying that Nikola Tesla had a input to it in the beginning. Correct. And, uh, you know, Dr. John Eric von Neumann definitely did work on it. He himself told me that. And uh, I think Al's idea of what happened on the boat, <coughs> excuse me, it was pretty much correct, because also I've had the same idea from other witnesses, like Duncan Cameron, who was also on the boat with Al. All so right, I really so don't have any quarrels with Al. So, so then you think the story is essentially correct? It's essentially correct. I think he may have missed some items and some of the points. One one thing that uh, that I've found as I've interviewed a lot of people who talk about um, time travel, uh, mm -hmm. talk about uh, alien spacecraft and the way uh, space might be uh, warped and the way it might be jumped across, in fact, and the technologies that they're talking about are strikingly similar to the one that uh, Al Bielek told us about. Well, <clears throat> again, <clears throat> we're discussing here what happened when you pulse a magnetic field to extremely strong levels. It's well known in the quantum physics world that if you pulse a magnetic field beyond, I believe it's a thousand Tesla field strength, it is highly possible to bend space and time. Now, if you can control this, it is theoretically possible to gain control of space and the time continuum which would lead to the ideas that all this stuff you hear coming out of the UFO legends has some scientific basis behind us, behind it. Although a lot of your physicists will not accept the idea that there are parallel multiple realities, but your quantum physics is beginning to accept that idea at this point, and a lot of them always have. What was the mission of the Montauk Project? What was the, uh, uh, what were they trying to do, accomplish? What was the central theme? <clears throat> well, after the stealth technology was developed, it was suggested that this is the first time we have definite evidence that the mind of man is sensitive to electromagnetic fields. Let's research this further and develop population control, we can weaponize this thing as to make the enemy surrender. And, you know, I'm sure the possibilities are mind-boggling at this point. 
Congress said, no, we don't want this. This is mind control. This is too politically active. They were setting up to research literally mind control technologies. They went to the military and said, uh, would you be interested in this kind of a weapon? Of course, this is every tactician's dream. So the military said, yes, we are, and they gave them the old Montauk Air Force Station, which is only about 40 miles away from Brookhaven Labs, mm -hmm. that they can do this stuff in secrecy and not be under the watchful eye of the, con the congressional committees. Well, when you say mind control, what exactly were they able to do to <clears throat> a person? Well, they were able to essentially inject a thought into a person's mind, make him believe it's his own thought, and control what you're thinking and therefore have some effect on what you're doing. They could literally read out what you're thinking. They could modify your thought patterns. Oh. What, what? And this was done at a distance using radio waves. At a distance using radio waves. That's what this whole thing was about. Remember, it started by studying the effects of electromagnetics on human beings in the right. cell technology. And it evolved into this device that could literally reach into a person's mind. At a distance? At a distance. Uh, and Up to about thousands of miles. We're not sure exactly how far it was. All right. You said you can't talk about the, um, the technical aspects of uh, whatever allowed... Uh, you know, the, the biologically friendly uh, fields to be applied. Mm -hmm. But can you talk about the technology that allows mind control? Or is that one yes, of the same? Yes, because I did not sign for that. They use mind control to make anyone that worked on the project forget what they did. Well, all right. How, what, what technology is beyond, uh, behind that? I know radio waves, but radio waves generally are totally harmless and without effect to biological entities, they're all around us. Well, this, as you've probably been reaching, this is coming up to a lot of debate at this point, exactly how harmless are these electromagnetic waves. That's true. Most of our waves that we do deal with in our environment are what we call continuous waves, CW, like coming out of your radio transmitter. Right. Human beings are sensitive to pulsed waves, fast on and off semi-random fractal-based type modulations in pulse form. They use pulse frequency and pulse amplitude. It's a very, very specialized form of modulation resembling some very modern chirp-type radar signals. All right, so it's a, it's a true pulse then. It's not just a pulse modulation. It's a true pulse. It's a frequency-hopping pulse. Frequency-hopping? Yes, yeah, it, it goes from frequency to frequency to frequency. If you tune it in on a radio receiver, it just sounds like a crack at a particular frequency. Then it goes to another frequency, you got another crack, and it hops around from frequency to frequency. Montauk had about 20 different frequencies. They hop between 420 and 460 megahertz. 420 and 460 again, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, the Russians are using something, uh, something or another that we call the woodpecker. Well, that's down at HF. That's HF, is correct. Right. But, and so it's and not... that's the same, similar type of modulation scheme. Is it? Again, it's a pulse with a chirp inside the pulse. Oh. I've looked at the Russian woodpecker. In fact, we have what we call over-the-horizon radar here, which looks almost identical but much more sophisticated. And when that first appeared on the air, I, I called the FCC and asked them what it was, and they said it was the American version it was the American over the horizon radar. And I said, oh, you mean like the Russian woodpecker? And he said, yeah, it's our version of the woodpecker. I see. And and so you, then you're saying that uh, with the right kind of pulse in the right frequency range... Not the frequency range, how you hop from frequency to frequency. So remember, you're building essentially a hologram, a holographic type <coughs> information packet out of delta frequency information and delta amplitude information and delta phase. Of course, phase and frequency is the same. Remember, you're dealing here with very fast deltas. You have to integrate this into essentially a random ordered white noise pattern built very much on fractals. All right. Let's assume then that all of this, which is going to begin to get above some of their heads and perhaps mine as well, uh, all of this would affect a biological entity. How it's would... a very unique 
type of radio signal. The next question is, how would you make it specific to any uh, particular biological entity, uh, particularly okay, at a distance? that is very interesting itself. See, at the Montour Project, we use what we call a witness or a signature. A signature is a group of frequencies, an electromagnetic frequency transform, which represents a particular human being, like a set of fingerprints. You will perceive a holographic thought with the signature, transmit the thought, and then you know follow it with the signature. That signature would identify it as a person's particular thought. All you would have to do is identify the person's signature, and as the signal is being generated, it will be transmitted with that signature. Montauk essentially was what we like to call a mind amplifier. So, yes, okay, I'm beginning to get it. So an individual then is required as part of the, in effect, the transmitted portion. Yeah, the overall signal that was being transmitted was generated by a human being at Montauk. Uh-huh. They had a group of sensors that picked up his holographic thought pattern, processed it through a very large computer system, and then put it into a modified radar transmitter. That's where I came into the picture. I was the one that was in charge of modifying the <laughs> radar transmitter. Oh, that's incredible. Oh, I see. All right, so that's how you got into this. Yeah. You were they actually... essentially built a mind amplifier. Yeah, I understand, a mind amplifier. And, and you... that led to all sorts of things, including mind control, precipitation of objects. You know, uh, there were all sorts of things that were done from this. Well, let's they say... They were able to create an object out of the background ether. Good. Because if a person right. sitting at the input of this could visualize that object in their artificial reality or virtual reality, this equipment had the capability of making it real. We're talking uh, probably at least 100 million watts continuous, not pulsed, power that they had out there. Because the thing was modified to what's known as BMUs, which had 100 megawatt continuous power. Did it actually create an object or did it create um, the vision of an object? It could do either one depending upon the fidelity of the transform being reproduced through the equipment. Like you could picture if your signal coming out of your transmitter was complete enough it would be theoretically possible to recreate you at the other end. The reason you can't is one, the receiver doesn't have enough power, then the information channel from the transmitter to the receiver is nowhere near high enough fidelity in the other dimensions and realities required to do it. This is what we tried to do at Montauk, was bring up this fidelity factor of broadcast. What could you get an individual to do? You say you could put a, an idea in an individual's mind. Uh, how much uh, a power of suggestion could you accomplish okay, that? I really don't know because that's the logistics of the project. And remember, the information was very compartmentalized. Now, legend, this is reports from people who I've spoken to, told me that they can get a person to do almost anything they want. This is the way it was put. And almost the sky was the limit. Preston, is time travel possible? Well, the thing you have to keep in mind is... If you go into pure metaphysics, the non-physical mind is a ripple or a transform or a form on the space-time continuum. If you're going to get your way into the non-physical mind, you've got to generate a time wave, which is like a warping or a, you know, or a uh, repetitive bending of the time function. Now, if you can get into this, you have the remnants of a time machine. Now, I know when things were being created out of real time. What I mean is when the concentration would be at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and the object would appear early or after that time, they got very excited, shut the project down for a couple of months and sent us all back to school to learn about time. I know they were interested in time manipulation, but of course, who wouldn't be? Yes. Now, being that we're compartmentalized, I have no personal knowledge of how successful the time portal per se was. Again, people who had worked with the time portal tell us that it was stable, and that it was usable. Meaning you could travel in time, yeah. meaning physically travel to another time. Okay, now the newer quantum theories 
even those theories appearing in Scientific American, are saying that there are multiple realities where time is different, mm -hmm. and because of the multiple realities, all time does coexist. And it's possible to move from point A to point B in time. And they're saying even it's possible to go into the future, which has a lot to say about is the future predestined or isn't it? Exactly. If you can travel into the future, to me, it means that we're already predestined as to what's going to happen. I believe if you make a time loop from point A to point B, you just predestine between point A and point B. All right. Uh, Preston Nichols is my guest. Uh, he was involved in the Montauk Project. This is a fax that came. Uh, actually, it's not. It came to me on America Online on a computer service, Internet. And uh, it was Greg in San Diego. Your guest uh, tonight has remarked that a, a particular technology had to be um, reduced to accommodate humans. Could he elaborate on that statement without violating the secrecy agreement with the government? In other words, is there anything at all that you can tell us about the adaptation of the uh, technology to be biologically friendly? Well, let's say first that there are three levels of stealth. The first two we hear about quite often, which is the radar cross-section, which is how much radar signal does the thing reflect. The second level is absorbing the radar signal. Now, if you've seen a picture or seen a stealth bomber or a stealth fighter, you'll know darn well it's a huge pancake, and it's not, it gives a lot of radar cross-section. Yes. So they didn't do a good job there. And I have worked with the absorbing coatings in order to try to cut down reflections inside of component enclosures, and that stuff doesn't work all that well. Composite materials. Yes. Yeah, so what this is saying is there's got to be a third level. The third level is electromagnetic bottle. Now, how they made the thing user-friendly in a nutshell, this is alluded to in some of the uh, aircraft publications, the electromagnetic bottle. They found out that when they cut off the human being from the natural background clocks, you know, the Schumann resonance and all this sort of thing, he had a tendency to become disoriented. Now, well, no, I, I don't know what you mean. What do you mean when you cut him off from normal human clocks? Well, the Earth has a clock. It's commonly called the Schumann resonance, discovered by W.O. Schumann, which every time lightning strikes in the cavity between the upper atmosphere, the ionosphere, and the Earth, this cavity rings. The frequency is around 8 hertz. It slows between 7 hertz and 9 hertz, typically, depending upon the time of day. That's very low. Yeah, very, very low. And this is sort of what clocks our biological functions. Also, this changing of this frequency from night to day is what causes us to wake up, go to sleep. It causes a lymphatic flush of the uh, system. Mm -hmm. It also has a lot to do with the alpha beta gamma rhythms in the brain. Now, the other problem, they had to, the original technology created a solid field. They had to somehow focus this field into a shell so that the people were not getting irradiated by this large field. I'm not, I'm not talking atomic radiation, but essentially electromagnetic radiation. There, there, mm -hmm. there is a difference. Yes. But either one can be just as dangerous, especially when you're using pulse magnetic fields like they were using to bend space-time to the point where they're just outside of our continuum so the thing was somewhat invisible either radar or fully invisible. Hmm. So you could get uh, different levels of stealth depending on yes. how... Yes, you can. Huh. They go from either zero being in our reality or 90 degrees out being in the imaginary reality. At that point, the object is gone. What are they doing at Montauk now? Well, present day, it is a state park. It's listed on all the maps as Department of Parks property. Huh. The state park is annexed on to the Montauk Point State Park. It's known as the Camp Hero Park. Only thing is, the park is closed to the public. Oh. They got a big fence up around it. They got security on the base. They got an electric gate. And there's two power lines going into the park, each capable of uh, multi-megawatts. Now, what's a state park doing with multi-megawatts? Good question. Now, we've also known that there's all sorts of activity. They have what we believe to be a fake 
the program for reclaiming the site and detoxing the site. They talk of removing uh, asbestos. Asbestos? Around the facility, there's these elevated pipes that they use to carry hot water, which have asbestos jackets. Even to this day, they haven't taken that off, and that's the easiest thing to get off. Hmm. And probably some of the most dangerous is as the wind blows, that asbestos is powdering and being blown all over the place. So if they were really removing asbestos, that would have been one of the first things they would have gotten to. Well, what kind of buildings are there? They're demolishing a lot of the old derelict base building. We believe the active area is underground. We've had reports, and I know I've been in the underground, but we've had reports that there's now an eight-level underground, which is huge, goes out for miles. Of course, this, this, some of this could be exaggeration. Is there anything... Uh, anything... We know that there's a particle accelerator out at Montauk as well. Uh-huh. Is there anything else at Montauk that would justify that kind of uh, a, a power to it um, on the ground, uh, above ground? Is in other no, words... it's just... It's, it's a bunch of derelict buildings. One building is being used as essentially... The, the State Park Police cop lives there. Now, what the hell is he going to use with that kind of power? And secondly, there's a State of New York Park Commission maintenance garage, motor pool maintenance garage. They have this one garage with these three huge transformers. I've heard anywhere from one and a half megawatts to ten megawatts going in. Now, even if they put in a megawatt of power, there'd be enough heat created to burn that building down. So, you know, what are they doing with this power going in that building? I say it's going underground. Well, wouldn't it be... Now, also... Well, wait a minute. Wouldn't it be possible, um, uh, Preston, to uh, literally follow the power lines and find out uh, if and where they go underground? Well, the one power line goes underground at the place where the maintenance garage is. Oh. The second power line goes right to the white building where the cop lives. Oh, and we believe it goes underground from those buildings. Now, what I was also going to mention is there are some cement buildings on top of what we call Radar Hill, where the radar tower is, the computer center is, which is physically part of the underground. And if you put your ears up against the cement walls, you'll hear like machinery running. There are mm -hmm. pipes that stick up out of the ground that I've dropped a microphone down and you'll hear the whine of a turbine and the grinding of some sort of fan. Now, for a derelict uh, station, what is the machinery that we hear running? What do you I'm think? I'm not the only one that hears this. A lot of people have reported this. I understand. What do you think they are doing there? Some sort of something going into the electromagnetics of the planet itself. It's been suggested that the planet is tilting, and that's what they're trying, uh, tilting on the axis, and that's what they're trying to prevent. Who knows? What they're doing is up to a lot of speculation and conjecture. All I can tell you is if you go out there at the right time, you'll pick up a very slow pulse transmission between 420 and 460 megahertz. Again, oh. it's still out there. I got recordings of it. And also you'll pick up a very complex data transmission at 173 megahertz, which is in the guard band for Channel 7. That's why they can't watch Channel 7. If you DF these uh, transmissions, it goes right to the old base. Well, isn't that something? Now, the 173 megahertz transmission, it was done by any civilian. The FCC had come and shut them down. In a New York second. Ah, uh, that's true. Uh, do you think that that is some sort of uh, uh, remote control, perhaps, or I, it is some sort of a data link? What the purpose is, I really don't know, because I have no way of decoding it. Uh huh. Because uh I recorded it, wideband recording, video recordings, and handed it to different people, and they tried all the known codes on it. It doesn't decode. So it's some sort of government secret code, most likely. Is there mind control going on now? There are all sorts of transmissions going on right now which are definitely psychoactive, whether they're on purpose or accidental, I really don't know. And they seem to have effect on a subliminal level on our consciousness. Tell me, uh, you were saying, in effect, that what they were doing was amplifying the human mind. Yes. 
uh, is can that be done with any human being, or are there some humans that lend themselves more toward that? Okay, theoretically, it can be done with any human being, but you want a person who is trained that when he concentrates, his whole fiber, his whole being concentrates on the one thing. That's a specially trained person. Theoretically, any one of us could be trained to do it if we went through the training and we had the capabilities and the qualities, whatever that is. All right. Duncan Cameron is a very unique individual, being able to, he can only concentrate on one thing at a time. He can't concentrate on multiple tasks. <laughs> yes. He's so trained to go one thing at a time. See, the human being has to create a virtual reality in his mind. And then the equipment picks out that uh, emanations of that reality. So, of course, the more complete that reality is, the more complete the uh, transform or the metaphysical thought form would be. And so you're saying an individual using this process with that equipment could create anything from a material object to a being or an entity or a monster. Well, we know that they could create objects. When they went to try to create living beings, they had trouble creating living beings because now you need a much higher degree of information and uh, fidelity. I'm sure you do. Yes. Uh, any living, living creature. Is much more complex and much more detailed. Exactly. It's like taking a TV set and trying to put a thousand-line picture on it. You just can't oh. do it. How far have they come in the fidelity area? I don't know. Since 83, I have no knowledge. What part did Montauk play, uh, or what part do you know that it played, in the Philadelphia experiment? As I recall, Al Bielek said... Well, Montauk is the place where the two sailors came to. Exactly. We're finding that there's quite a few sailors that came from the Eldridge to Montauk and did different things. And the Montauk project was the other end of the time loop between 43 and 83. They used this totally fixed time loop in between two points, actually 3.63 as well. They used this time loop as like a master loop to anchor open-ended loops. That means there's equipment only on one end. Uh -huh. Wherever somebody like Duncan Cameron could picture the time vortex going, if the fidelity was good enough, it would go there. But you'd have to have an anchor to hold it all stable, and that's what they use 43, 63, 83 for. What made Montauk the other end of it? In other words, what focused on Montauk as the other end, or how did that... Well, in metaphysics, we have what we call a witness. What this is, you take a photograph of a person. That photograph carries their signature, aura, whatever you want to call it. That's a witness. We made sure that we had a witness from Montauk to the Eldridge by having some of the equipment on the Eldridge physically part of the Montauk system. We had people present that were on both projects, and then they used the Earth biorhythm cycle as the final witness effect and guarantee the lockup of the two projects through space and time. And there's rumors that this may have even ripped open hyperspace enough to allow all the UFOs that have come in recently since 47. Wow. But has made a major rift in space-time between 43 and 83, no question. Another What's person going to come in through that? I don't know. Another but, person who sent me a fax wanted to know if any of this technology is alien technology. I, some of it is rumored to be alien technology. I do believe that this is testing alien concepts, either gathered from down UFOs or from the legendary alien uh, treaty with the U.S. government, you know, trading people for technology. Do you, do you believe that that is true? I've seen nothing to say yes, and I've seen nothing that says no. That's careful. <laughs> that's a careful well, First answer. of all, I'm not going to tell you something I know is false. That's, I don't know. that's good. I'm glad. All I'll tell you is I don't know. All right. I'll tell you what I do know about it. All right. Again, uh, let's go into, the again, the basic technology that's Correct. allowing all of this. And uh, in some detail, in other words, uh, if I wanted to set up something that would bend space and time or that I could... Uh, uh, begin to focus uh, waves to affect biological entities. 
what kind of technology would I use? How would I put it together? Well, if you did it the way the government did it, their benchmark was let's kill flies with sledgehammer. Lots and lots of power. They had a final amplifier in their transmitter which had an input of at least 200 million watts of power, wasted half of that in heat, heated the Atlantic Ocean with it, and put out 100 million watts. That means to do anything, you would have to build maybe one hundredth of that. It means you'd have to build a megawatt transmitter and then pulse the thing, frequency hop it and pulse it. Then you would have to somehow correlate this to represent a fractal based frequency time transform. All right, that gets a little complicated. Let me yes, let me give you let me give you an analogy, and you tell me if this is a good analogy. Go ahead. It's possible. It uh, it certainly is possible because it was done to send a signal across the Atlantic Ocean with a spark gap transmitter. True. It could be done, but it takes massive, massive amounts of power that is very wasteful. Which they didn't have in those days. They were transmitting some other form of electromagnetics. You consider the coherer they used at the other end needs millivolts of signals. And if you transmit a kilowatt across the Atlantic Ocean, you get maybe 10 microvolts tops. How the hell did that coherer trigger? You tell me. Well, my point was you could send a, a, a spark signal across the Atlantic. It was done, but it required a very great deal of power. You can do it today. There wasn't that much power. Well, compared to the power that you, for example, with a modern uh, a single sideband uh, narrowband transmitter, mm -hmm. you could do it today with well, far less power. You do about 10 watts. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that seems like a good analogy to the beginning of the Philadelphia experiment uh, versus the refinements that occurred at Montauk. But still at Montauk, they used tremendous amounts of power. Of course, they were trying to bend the space-time continuum, and it takes tremendous amounts of power. Any quantum physicist will tell you that. It takes something like five and 10,000 ampere per meter magnetic field. Yes, but the original uh, Philadelphia experiment was, as you said, kind of a blunderbuss compared to yes. what could be done today. Well, the Montauk project was much more finesse. That's why Montauk project controlled the vortex. They didn't control it from Philadelphia. They controlled it from Montauk. Uh -huh. Philadelphia was just another power source. That's all it was. It was an open-ended power source. They had no finesse. All they did was just generate tons of power, put it out in the ether, and by gosh, by God, something happened. What did you actually do? What did you work on? I was started out as a technician, graduated up to an engineer. My responsibility was to modify the old SAGE radar transmitter. I was the fellow that uh, set up the pulse modulation schemes, the synchrodyne modulation schemes, and set up the frequency hopping. I had to work on the uh, coho to synthesize local oscillators that were used in the transmitter. What did they tell you you were working on? They told me that we were working on equipment to interface human beings to technology, the mind of man to technology, which was very interesting to me. I should say. I should say. Uh, but you were actually working on the pulsing of the signal that would carry a transmission, not so much uh, uh, that is to affect other, other human beings, right? Where you were... yeah, I didn't realize this until later on in the project. This is what they were really doing. At that time, I was so involved in it, I couldn't see myself getting out of it easily. Well, uh, it seems to me that's a very, very dangerous technology. Very dangerous. It's very dangerous, yes. I agree with you. Do that's you, uh, why we all decided towards the end of the project to crash it. Yeah, that's all, oh, you did. Uh, oh, that's what I was going to ask you. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's why the monster was created, to crash the project. Because Duncan especially was saying things that the rest of us didn't, you know, didn't dare say. Duncan found God, got excised, we don't know what happened, but all of a sudden he calls a meeting and says, hey, this thing is going totally into the lower world and the lower domains. It's, it's getting very evil. Of course, we all knew this, but we didn't have the guts to say it. And we all agreed, yes, yes, yes. What do we do? Well, we got to bring this thing down. How do we do it? Well, let's, let's create this big, hungry, nasty monster that will scare them into crashing it. Fascinating. And, and it worked? 
Yes, I worked very well. All I did was drive them on the ground, just shut them down for a while. Uh, I've got a number of questions for you, uh, Preston, faxed in, and then we'll get to the telephones. Uh, Art, I would like to ask Preston whether there is a possibility that the occurrences at Amityville, New York, could somehow be related to the Montauk Project. I got this thought while reading his book, Montauk Revisited. That's your book? Yep. You mean the Amityville Horror? That's right. Yeah, that's right. I don't know. I was involved as a parapsychology researcher years ago, and we really couldn't tie much of anything to that house. That's the only statement I'll make on it. Uh, you were there? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, you were at Amityville. About ten miles uh, west of here. What? Uh, very briefly, let's take a sidetrack because that's fascinating. Uh, what did you find at Amityville? I, you know, I've seen the movie. I don't know how much uh, relationship that has to what really happened. Well, we checked the uh, heat, we checked the heat differentials, we checked the static charges, we checked them for magnetic anomalies. We didn't find anything. We didn't find anything to back up the bugs. We didn't find anything to back up the bleeding walls. I myself feel that this is something that maybe there was a genuine haunting, but the fellow that wrote the book uh, just blew the thing way out of proportion. All right. But we um... couldn't find anything to back it up. I was involved in a team of parapsychologists that was called in to investigate it. All right. There was even rumors of an Indian burial ground under the house. Who knows what really happened there? I don't know. All right. Um, dear Art, I wonder if you would ask your guest if the super collider was in any way planned to be used with the project he was working on, Montauk. No, because the super collider came afterwards. Although we have been getting a lot of information lately that they are using particle accelerators as particle beam weapons, of course, a particle beam power source or a particle beam amplifier. This is where they use particles going to the velocity of light doing the mass energy conversion based upon E equals MC squared. I will tell the public that the physicists have reached the speed of light with particles and that they today are using this as a power source or a power amplifier. Imagine a uh, power amplifier that can tap the power of a nuclear bomb, literally. This may be where they got all the power to bend space and time at Montauk. We know there was a particle accelerator, and I believe it's active today because once myself and other people walking over, it got a dose of some sort of radiation. Well, I know, I know this. Uh -huh. Preston, uh, I know this. Uh, I know this, that they have considered using nuclear explosions or controlled explosions in uh, in satellites to focus uh, beams. Is that, is that... Yeah, to focus a laser. Yeah. Yeah. Do... I, I've read the same thing. That's supposedly a Star Wars weapon. Exactly. But we really don't need that. All we got to do is accelerate particles to see. They do it by starting out with a large accelerator, dumping into a smaller one, into a smaller one yet, and each each time you go to a smaller and smaller one, the velocity just goes up. Remember, as you bring the particles closer in a circle, what happens? The momentum makes them go faster and faster. And at some point, you're going to reach C, the speed of light. And magical things happen when you reach the speed of light. Well, uh, what about surpassing it? Is it possible? Not in this dimension. So that, in, in effect... I'm 100% correct. You cannot surpass the speed of light within our reference frame. If you're going to surpass the speed of light, you got to do it in another reference frame relative to ours. And I'm saying it's, I believe it's possible to go past it, but not in our reality as we know it. you got to warp into another reality to go past the speed of light relative to us here. All right. Uh, listen, this comes from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, please ask Mr. Nichols if there's a way that anybody can render himself or herself impervious to mind control by any outside force or protection. Well, what you have to do is you have to consider the level of consciousness and awareness this thing is operating at, and you just got to raise your level of awareness above that. The mind, if it's aware of what's going on, the mind can uh, automatically protect against this. That's part of why I'm putting this information out, to let people know what's going on so they got an idea of how to protect themselves on a subconscious level. You're saying then, in effect, you can protect yourself with your own will. Right. All right, I've got it, I this think. This is a message of the New Age, essentially. So the New Age is mixed in with all of this? Oh, yes. 
very definitely. <laughs> All right. This is the application of new age metaphysical principles to technology. This is what we're talking about. Uh, expand on the evil part of your statement, if you would. Well, I feel the whole mind control aspect of the thing is evil. Man is meant to have a free mind, not to be dominated. Also, uh, they were working in maneuvering and manipulating time so certain people would have power that probably shouldn't have power or the power group would get more power and they get more oppressive and, you know, the whole nine yards of this. Well, and I guess also, uh, you I, remember the old, uh, Preston, you remember the old expression, uh, once they've seen something or another, Perry, how are you going to keep them down on the farm? Once they've experimented with mind control or imagine or know they can control minds, uh, how are you ever going to stop them? The only way I can see you stopping them is get the population aware enough that it just doesn't work. Is there any way that a person could know that their mind is being controlled? I guess if you start doing things out of character, that would be a good sign of it. I... Also, if you had the monitoring equipment, if you knew what to listen for, if you're educated in a radio like you and I are, are, you could probably pick this up on a radio and notice the very sharp, edgy tones that would appear on your radio. Hmm. Uh, I can tune in and listen and hear the stuff. We as human beings, uh, our government, whoever, the powers that be, would have great interest in mind control, and if they're not working on it, I think that would be more fantastic than, uh, than believing that they are working on right. it. I mean, it's that simple. Well, I'd like to say at this point that if someone comes and asks me how much of a legend is true, I would tell them the Philadelphia experiment is true, the mind control aspiration the mind, mind control part of the project is probably 90-odd percent correct. I'm just not sure exactly how well the time tunnel worked. That would be my, asset, you know, my assessment, the assessment of how successful they were. All right. So, so I thoroughly believe the mind control worked, and it's thoroughly possible. The only thing is they could not at that time work on mass population using the particle beam system that interacts with the brain directly, you don't need a signature anymore. So, using the particle beam system. So you're, you're saying that mass mind control is not necessarily possible? Today it is. Today it is. Today it is because, oh, great. see, before you used to go in with a signature to the non-physical mind. Today they're using a particle beam to modulate the particle interchange between the synaptic interchanges in the brain to either read patterns or to modulate patterns on the brain. Oh, boy. So you're saying they could be uh, sending out signals that are actually controlling the masses. Mm-hmm. Synapses. Wow. Wonderful. I know, uh, Preston, that there's been a lot of research done on the effect of low frequencies yeah. on, on human beings. Well, if what he's saying is it can transmit the effect of a whole room full of people, the eyes of the head of you. All this might be doing is fragmenting your own memories, working directly physically into the brain. And, and this could be done with some sort of VLF, ELF type device. All right. Uh, what about the, uh, the transmissions made by the middle part of our country? Very powerful um, uh, ELF. Uh, transmissions uh, to our submarines. Yeah, I forget what that's called. I know what you're talking of. Uh, I was just wondering if you think that kind of level of uh, low-frequency transmission could affect uh, biological yeah. entities that are close to the source. That appears to be mostly sinusoidal teletype-type modulation. Right. It's not direct on and off. So without the pulsing, you don't think there'd be a lot of effect? No. All right. Remember, the mind itself, the brain will automatically uh, even out a change in level. you got to change the level so fast that the DC restoration in the oh. neurological system doesn't work. The human brain does generate a signal. It, it is a very weak signal normally, isn't that? Well, it's actually a virtual state signal. It's what? I don't it, reduce that so I can understand it. Well, you know, when you do a complex calculation, the figure phase angle, you get sine, cosine function, real yes. world, imaginary function. Yes. The human emanations are based upon the imaginary functions, not the real. 
But if you're 100% right, the real world emanations from a human being are very weak, but the imaginary world emanations are very strong. This is why you need typically vacuum potential to, to detect this stuff. Hmm. What have you seen exactly, and how, did, how and where? At Montauk, they had a little creature that looked all the world like the little greys as described by Whitley Strieber. Oh? A four foot tall, and they stunk to high heaven. Stunk? And then we had a thing that resembled a cross between a lizard and a human being. What it was, I really don't know. I have heard that description before, too, kind of reptilian. Yeah. The closest thing, there was an old Star Trek episode where Captain Jerk fought something called a Gorn that sort of looked like what uh, I saw at Montauk. Now, I will say, I don't drink, I don't use drugs, I don't do any of that stuff. I also don't hallucinate. Um, they, they, they were. Have you, ever, have you ever been under the care of a psychiatrist? Nope. No? All right, that, I just had to add that one in there. So in other no, words, that, that's, a, that's a valid question. Well, yeah. um, I mean, some of this you've got to admit, Preston, it's wild stuff. I know it's wild stuff, but this is why I doubted my own sanity at times. Myself, on I the, come to the conclusion that's not me that I was seeing this crud real. Also, a lot of the other people in Montauk saw the same thing and described exactly the same. How many other people have uh, cooperated what you're saying, or even parts, substantial parts of what you're saying? Oh, about 30-odd people. You know, there are a lot of people listening, or who would fax me or write to me or you, and would say you're crazy as a loon. Uh, what, what, what would you say to them? Um, how would you defend that? Now, technically, you have a lot of details, and I am impressed by that, but some of it is, is quite admittedly pretty fantastic stuff. It's very fantastic stuff. The first, first thing I would mention is people used to say to me they remembered me from the Montauk base. I didn't remember them until I broke the memory blocks I had. This stuff is highly possible. We have a lot of witnesses. I think we have to look at, can a thousand Frenchmen be wrong? <laughs> we um, have no real-world documentation, evidence, proof. The only proof we have is that they're doing something strange, even to this day. And we were talking of 420 to 460 megahertz broadcast. That's right. And we're still finding emanations in the same frequency range to this day. I first got excited thinking I was picking up the signal out of time from the 70s and the 80s, but I came to realize, no, this is this is generated today. If they're doing something like this today, sitting in the specs, sending out a very strong ELS signal that I picked up on coils as pulses without a carrier, in the carrier, if they're still sending out, that means the equipment I'm describing is there to this day producing signal, and it probably was there in the 70s and the 80s, and they probably were playing back then. If you want to listen to our show ad-free, 24-7, access audio archives, live chat with me, and much more, you need to become a Coast Insider now. So you're telling me your grandmother, who died a few weeks ago, came and visited you last night in your bedroom, and you're not scared? Are extraterrestrials living among us? I don't know if it's true or not, folks, but we're going to find out. If you enjoy stories like these and want to learn more about the mysteries of the universe with me, become a Coast Insider now to access hundreds of our archive shows to listen anytime, anywhere. Sign up now at coasttocoastam.com slash coastinsider. That's coasttocoastam.com slash coastinsider. <laughs> 